Can everyone hear me? Can you thumbs up? Yes, all right, cool. All right, well, hi everybody. My name is Kate Worling. I am a uh, solutions architect and machine learning specialist at Amazon Web Services. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk about uh, Amazon SageMaker Ground Truth, which is a newer service. Uh, it launched at reInvent 2018. And what we're gonna do is get really deep into how we can leverage Ground Truth to accelerate the building of machine learning data sets. So real quick, um, before we get too deep into the session itself, I wanna highlight a couple of related breakout sessions that will be worth checking out. Um, so tomorrow we're gonna to have Amazon SageMaker Deep Dive. Um, Kumar uh, was gonna actually be there. He's a SageMaker product manager, so he'll be leading that presentation. So it'll be a, a very good um, thorough review of SageMaker and all of its different features. Uh, we're gonna have an introduction to GroundStation. So AWS GroundStation I recognize is probably loosely, <laughs> loosely related to uh, SageMaker. Um, but I'm a huge fan of space and um, the research in the space domain. And they collect a lot of interesting data that can be leveraged for machine learning use cases. So uh, very cool stuff. I recommend checking that one out as well. And then lastly, we have uh, SpaceNet. So SpaceNet, um, they're going to be doing a presentation on the folks who built the SpaceNet data set. Uh, so for those of you who haven't heard of SpaceNet, SpaceNet um, is a geospatial imagery data set. Um, akin to ImageNet. And they're actually going to talk about their challenges of defining uh, validation metrics for their models and um, how they had to iterate on actually their label strategies for the data itself. So um, for those of you looking deep, want to get deeper into labeling strategies and how to um, come up with a strategy for labeling your data, that's going to be a very interesting discussion. It's going to go deeper into the statistics, uh, the mathematics behind uh, labeling data sets, whereas today we're going to cover uh, more of a 200 level discussion on how uh, SageMaker or Ground Truth can help with labeling data sets. Great, so the reason why we're all here, uh, I'm sure, is to answer this question. Um, how can we build machine learning models faster? Um, so at AWS, I mean, we have a very broad and deep machine learning stack, uh, which is all about um, enabling people to build machine learning models and incorporate machine learning into their uh, models faster. And today we're actually gonna focus on one of those services in the stack, which is gonna be Amazon SageMaker. So Amazon SageMaker is our managed end-to-end -end machine learning platform. And it's designed to accelerate your ability um, to build, train, and deploy machine learning models. So this slides a little bit deeper into that. So um, Amazon SageMaker, again, accelerating your ability to build, train, and deploy machine learning models. Uh, so you have a bunch of features available around those three key components of the machine learning process. Uh, with Build, we have managed notebooks. Uh, we also have our labeling service, Ground Truth, which is what we're gonna discuss in depth today. Uh, for Train, you can do uh, one-click training, which enables you to spin up a cluster of instances to train. Um, so if you think about, hey, uh, I have a large data set, I might have, you know, a million images I need to train on, um, I can just spin up the GPU and horsepower necessary to actually train that data set. And whenever it's complete, SageMaker turns off that, those GPUs for me, saves off my model artifacts so I can't leave instances running in my account over the weekend. Um, I don't have to have a bunch of standby expensive GPU capacity sitting around as an idle resource. Um, so it can really help optimize costs around that. So that's one of the features in SageMaker. Uh, and then also the deployment piece, which I find to be the most popular feature in SageMaker, um, which actually will package your model artifacts into an endpoint and deploy that behind a REST API and allows you to do things like auto-scaling, A-B testing, uh, blue-green deployments. And so it makes it become much more like an application that you're managing instead of having to work directly with a machine learning model. Um, so these are all features that are within SageMaker. Again, if you're interested in going deeper on SageMaker, I recommend um, going to the SageMaker deep dive tomorrow. But today we're really gonna focus on that first part of the process. Because before we can use any of the really cool features of Amazon SageMaker, we need data. But first, I need data to get started. This is step one, probably one of the least exciting steps in the machine learning process, but also one of the most critical. So a lot of the first questions I'll get asked uh, with machine learning is, you know, what kind of training data do I need? What kind of training data? How much training data do I need? Um, how do we really get started on developing our data sets? And the answer is, of course, it depends. Uh, so there's a couple of different options depending on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. 
Um, there's not one machine learning algorithm that rules them all. There's actually a whole bunch of different machine learning algorithms out there. And the one you choose will be dependent on the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so here we have a couple of different examples. Um, broadly, there's kind of three categories that you'll see. Uh, the first of which would be like unsupervised learning. So with unsupervised learning models, um, you don't necessarily need a lot of labeled data, but you won't get very complex models. So unsupervised learning is really great for things like anomaly detection or finding clusters in your data. So doing like something like topic modeling. Um, those are where unsupervised learning can be very powerful. It's also very useful for helping you understand the data that you already have. Um, so looking for trends in your data, um, looking for uh, general things of interest within a large data set. So it does have a lot of power for analysis um, as well and doesn't require a lot of labeled data. So uh, for folks just looking to get, you know, understand what data they have within the organization and understand what machine learning might be useful for, unsupervised learning is a great place to start. But for most of us here, I'm sure we're trying to do something a little bit more specific. Um, we're not just looking for patterns in the data, we're looking for something specific in the data. Um, for that, we have a couple of different options. So uh, reinforcement learning, that's what DeepRacer is using. Reinforcement learning, um, the way you train a, a reinforcement learning model is actually through a bunch of simulations. So you'll have, for example, a car going around the track. And you simulate the car going around the track over and over and over and over until eventually a model gets trained that helps guide that car around the track. Um, so the key for reinforcement learning is being able to create the simulation environment. And sometimes that's just not really a realistic way to frame your problem. Um, an example here could be, let's say um, I work for Amazon and I want to track in our social media feed at the conference who's wearing Amazon t-shirts. So I want to be able to detect Amazon t-shirts. That doesn't really lean itself well to a reinforcement learning problem. I can't necessarily simulate Amazon t-shirts in different environments. Um, so where I'll end up instead is with supervised learning. In supervised learning, um, the way that actually works is you have a bunch of training data and this training data consists of an input, it could be an image, so in this example here is an image of a building and it has a label that tells you what's in your input, so building. So the label corresponds to what is your input, it's telling the model what I want to know from this input. And what we'll do is we'll take that picture of the building and we feed it into our machine learning algorithm. And the machine learning algorithm is going to give us a prediction. In this case, the prediction is car. So with no other information, we don't know if car is right or wrong. So we're done, right? No, we need to actually compare that to our label. And that's where labeling comes into this. And so we compare this to the label, and the label is building. Our model was wrong. And what this does is this triggers a process called backpropagation, where we actually adjust the model weights and the model learns. And so over time, as we iterate over and over, over hundreds of epochs, slowly but surely, the model will get more accurate. So what this requires is a lot of examples, a lot of labels of images of whatever your input's gonna be. So you need lots of labeled examples of your input. The problem is data labeling is hard. If you think about how many iterations, typically a data set will consist of hundreds, thousands, even millions of images just for computer vision. Um, text can be even more difficult whenever you start accounting for the nuances of languages, um, of slang, of regional dialects. And so labeling all that uh, takes a long time. And typically this is a very manual process. Even today, labeling tends to be a very uh, manual process, which makes it very time consuming, costly, and it can also make it difficult to achieve high accuracy, right? So we're still prone to human error because humans are actually labeling the data. So the examples here I have the little cars. Someone had to manually label the road as green. Someone had to draw in red for all the vehicles, yellow for the buildings. It could take a long time to label all this data, which is why we launched Amazon SageMaker Ground Truth. And the way SageMaker Ground Truth works is first you get all of your raw data so you collect that up and you put it into, let's say, an S3 bucket. And then you kick off a labeling job. We have a couple of predefined templates that you can leverage for your labeling job. Um, our examples here are bounding boxes. So you could say, here are the birds, draw boxes around the birds. You could do image classification. The example here is that they're playing basketball. You could have a picture where they're playing soccer. Um, you can actually do segmentation, which will tell you which pixels are the women, which pixels are the car, and that example there. 
Um, for text classification, you get things like sentiment and topic modeling. And lastly, you can always do custom tasks. So you have the ability to define any of these different labeling jobs. So once you select what kind of uh, labeling job you're going to have, then you can move into selecting your labelers. So here are some examples of data labelers. So you have quite a few options here as well. Uh, you can leverage Amazon Mechanical Turk and our public workforce to label your data set. You also have the option of using an internal private workforce. Um, so you can have you know, your office, your employees, or people you have sign up. In my case, it was usually <laughs> the interns that we had uh, as our private workforce uh, labeling all of our data. Or you could use third-party vendors. So you can actually work directly with vendors uh, who will label your data for you and contract directly with them. And you'll see there's some nice vendors out there that have things like US only uh, personnel who label your data and things like that. So you can actually negotiate that with a vendor and then create the labeling job through the console. So uh, a very nice integration there as well. OK, so we have our data. We know what we're going to label. We're going to draw squares on the birds. We picked out who's going to label our data. We're going to use, let's say, Mechanical Turk. So now we have our human annotators, and we kick off our labeling job. So the human annotators are going to go in there, and they're going to start drawing the squares on all the birds, making all the bounding boxes very manually, as it's traditionally done. But what will happen in Ground Truth is that after they've labeled 150 images or so, it's going to kick off this thing called active learning, which is actually going to train a machine learning model and begin to try to make automatic annotations. So after we have so many human annotations, this active learning model trains the first time around, it's going to try to make automatic annotations. Chances are it's not going to be the best at it. In fact, for an automatic annotation to become training data, it has to achieve higher than 80% accuracy. Um, so what we'll do then is if we say, OK, the model was not accurate enough with the automatic annotation, send it to the human labeler, and the human will still manually label it. But then we'll feed those human annotations back into the active learning model. And the active learning model is going to train again. And then it's going to train again. And then it's going to train again. Until eventually, it achieves enough accuracy that it can start doing more and more automatic annotations and begin to accelerate our ability to label all this data. And so you're able to actually train different labeling jobs together, for example. So we could say we label the birds six months ago. We have a new data set of birds. We're going to kick off a new labeling job. You can just take your old active learning model and redeploy it for your new labeling job. And it will continue to get more and more accurate as you get more and more labels. And this will really help speed up your labeling costs. In fact, Ground Truth can help um, reduce your labeling costs by up to 70% because of this active learning feature. So to show this, I'm actually going to pull up some demos. And we're going to do some labeling here and see how it works. So with that, let's switch to the demo. Can we switch? Let me throw it up. Uh oh. Well, that's not right. <laughs> it's the curse of doing live demos, right? Always something goes wrong. It's beautiful. Thank you. All right, so. We're going to live a little dangerously. I'm going to kick off a live labeling job. And if all goes according to plan, we'll have some Mechanical Turk folks start labeling images as I go through the demo. And we can go back and actually see what they've annotated. And maybe, if we're really lucky, we can see some active learning models kick off. So to start, I'm going to kick off a labeling job. So we're just going to let this execute in the background. And while that begins to start up and kick off our labeling job, I'm going to show you one that I actually already pre-ran. So you can see what the result is going to be. So in the SageMaker dashboard, so anyone that logs into the AWS account and goes to Amazon SageMaker will get this, this lovely dashboard view. If you go over here into Ground Truth and click labeling jobs, you can create a new labeling job to annotate your data. So this is one that I had previously created. So I'm going ahead and click that. And we can actually see what the labelers see. So whenever we create our labeling job, if we use one of those templates that I showed you, so the object detection, image classification, or segmentation, 
what'll happen is your mechanical Turks or your private workforce, whoever it is, will actually come in and they'll get an interface like this. And they'll ask you questions. So here we're doing image classification. So our question is, select an option. Is there a musical instrument in this image? Is there a fruit, a cheetah, a tiger, or a snowman? I think it's gonna be a musical instrument. Go ahead and give that a click. And then I will go ahead and click submit. And it gives you an example here because this is like a demo view of what our annotation is gonna look like. So we have um, a piece that tells us this is a crowd image classifier. So we know that the crowd annotated it, not the automatic annotations. Those will be labeled separately. So you can go ahead and do analysis on that later. And then it'll also tell you the label with musical instrument next to it. You can also give instructions in the UI as well. So here we have examples of what fruit look like, what musical instruments look like, what a cheetah looks like versus a tiger and a snowman. So this is what the interface will look like to your labelers as they go in and annotate. This is for image classifications. This will be a little different depending on your use case. So if you're doing like object detection or segmentation, it's gonna look a little bit different for that. And so we can see that I had a thousand examples that I sent in. And here are different music instruments that were labeled. So this, again, this is just image classification. So it's just telling me there was a musical instrument in the image itself. This is what we'll get out. So we'll actually get um, in the console, you can see the images themselves. All this is actually being saved in S3 so that we can access that and do analysis on it. Our data sets are also tracked in the data set console. So we can still go back to S3 and actually see the manifest files and where it's located in the bucket. And then we can see that we use a public workforce for this particular example. If you had a private workforce, that information would be in here. If you had a vendor workforce, that would be in here as well. Um, some other nice features in our labeling jobs. So even if we do human annotations, as I mentioned earlier, human annotations are prone to human error. Um, so you can actually configure the job to have multiple humans annotate each image. Um, so you would get perhaps three labels per image, and then we have a consolidation algorithm that will consolidate those three labels together to produce a more accurate label. So to give you an idea of what that would look like, I'm going to throw up our example notebook. Um, so here's actually an analysis on the output of the data set that I just showed you. So we can see that we had 1,000 images that we fed in, and roughly 700 of those were labeled by humans but 300 were automatically annotated. And so we can see this column here, this is gonna be our human iterations. This is a human labeled. And so for the first, that first crank of the wheel, right, that first active learning model we created, we got very few automatic annotations out of that. It did not achieve the accuracy yet for automatic annotations. The second crank of the wheel, again, the model is still not accurate enough to train or to deliver automatic annotations. So we actually have 400 samples that went into this, but we can see by sample 600, that third time the model's trained, we start getting these automatic annotations coming out on the other side. And then by the first crank of the wheel, we actually are getting significantly more automatic annotations. I know the, the I'm sorry, the legend's over top of it, but we see a lot more automatic annotations than we do manual. So we can see that flip starting to occur. And then if we were to now do another labeling job, we can reuse this active learning model and chain it to then use it for the next training job so we'd have even more automatic annotations moving forward. Another way to look at that is the cost per each iteration. So we had four iterations. Um, so you can see the first two are predominantly human cost. So um, but then we see three, that cost started to change to be an automatic cost. And then the fourth iteration was predominantly automatic annotations. So we can kind of see the cost break out and a third way to look at that would be the model curve itself. So we see our validation curves going down, our validation error is decreasing, our models are becoming more accurate. A couple other interesting charts to check out here. So um, here's another way to look at that as well. So we can see the breakout. Um, this is actually just analysis in our data set as well. So we can see that we had a pretty imbalanced data set, uh, mostly musical instruments. Uh, but what's interesting over here, I think, is the mean confidence is. This is the confidence score. So how confident am I that I labeled this musical instrument correctly? Um, so we can see for musical instruments, the human annotator, annotators were slightly more confident than the automatic annotations. But whenever we look at things like fruit and cheetah, that actually starts to flip-flop a little bit, or the automatic annotations had higher confidence scores than the human annotations. 
Um, so all of this data is going to be captured in your labeled data sets so that you can go ahead and do these analysis for your data to understand whether or not you actually trust the automatic annotations, for example, um, and also kind of how much you want to adjust your next labeling iteration. Do we want to have um, four people label each image, two people label each image to help you get the right accuracy you need? So these are some example images from the data set itself. Um, so Tiger, I think, is pretty interesting. <laughs> There's actually a little picture of Tigger <laughs> in there from the cartoon. Um, so he's captured in there as well. <laughs> so we can see that the, the data set itself is very diverse with the images. This is actually an open source data set um, that's actually been heavily curated. So because of that, we have we know, known labels. So we can actually see the accuracy scores coming out of this. Um, so our actual annotation error is 1.8% in total when compared to the original uh, open source data set labels. So if you look at the human annotations, um, we got 0.43% error from the human annotations and from the automatic annotations we're about 5% error. Um, so also some things to inspect and keep in mind um, with the automatic annotations. Now it would be interesting experiments to run this again and chain these models and see if that score goes up or down. I would hope down. Um, this is just an example of, of what you would actually get back from your model. All right. Um, and the final piece here I want to highlight is going to be this being put into operations. Um, so here we have an example of ground truth being used out in the field. So in this story here, um, I actually was working with a customer. And we were uh, ran out an aircraft. We were working with Elemental. And uh, <laughs> we actually rented this aircraft and installed an Elemental encoder onto the aircraft. And it was flying around and just doing some surveillance to test the quality of the image coming down off the aircraft, the quality of the video feed. Uh, and we wanted to show how you could do more complex machine learning whenever you have higher quality data, right? So uh, we're thinking about you know, data coming down at 480p versus 1020p. What kind of things can we find in the 1020p resolution versus 480? And how can this improve our machine learning models? Uh, the problem with this particular exercise that we ran, this little demonstration, um, was that we didn't really have any training data to initially train our model. Um, we had some example data that we got from Elemental that we could use for sort of testing uh, and playing around with, but we didn't really have um, a significant amount. I think it was about two hours of data total, which is not a lot to build a very robust uh, video model. So what we did is we actually used ground truth in our loop. So the plane would fly over for the day and it would collect and it would just fly around and just get data um, for about six hours. And we would take all the data from that and we were running on the snowball, but then we would go ahead and we'd sync that back up to the cloud. And then I would get into my S3 bucket. I would do a little bit of pre-processing in my SageMaker notebook. And then I kicked off a labeling job. And then annotators would come in there and they would label all of my information um, throughout the evening. In the morning, I had all this nice annotated data. I trained my model and then I pushed the updated model back out. So that by the end of the week, we were able to retrain the model five times. We were able to relabel each night, push out new models the next day, test it, relabel, push, test. So it was very cool, um, especially because before this, um, the way we had to do it was actually to have a bunch of interns. <laughs> Oops. We actually had a bunch of interns who um, had to manually go through and label all the data themselves. Help. <laughs> So with the interns, it took us a couple of weeks, and we only got through the data set once. So we were only able to retrain one time in the previous iteration. Looks good. All right. So here's actually what this looked like. So I think this is a very cool use case. Um, I think it's very common that whenever we start machine learning problems, we don't have enough data set or enough data for our data set. And so as we learn more, we need to label more and we need to iterate on the model itself. So using a tool like Ground Truth can really help accelerate that process. So here's an example of some of the labels that came out. So as we were flying the little camera around, um, so we can see we had multiple workers doing labels. So we think we had five workers per label. Um, this is an example of the consolidation algorithm at work cleaning up this really messy uh, labels over here. 
And here are some examples of the automated labels. So this was the automatically generated labels. Um, they look pretty darn good to me. So I was really excited because that, um, as we started to chain these models together by day five, uh, we were seeing about half of our images being annotated by the labels on here. All right, so then here's actually where we configure our training job. So I go ahead, I get on my label data, and then I just kick off the training job in the exact same notebook. And we can see the results coming out. So this is a SageMaker hosted endpoint. Now, if you remember that picture, though, the model is actually on that little snowball, right? So out in the field, we had this snowball. Um, so fun fact about SageMaker, the model artifacts that come out of SageMaker are just the same model artifacts you would get whether you trained on-premise or elsewhere, right? It's just going to be your TensorFlow model artifact, your MemXNet, whatever it is. So we're able to go ahead and just unzip those model artifacts, and then we actually package that into what we call a model serving file, so a MAR file that we use in our MXNet container. And this is actually what it looked like on the edge. Um, you'll notice there's a couple bounding boxes. That's because we actually to lower the confidence threshold, uh, because in the field, we tended to get lower confidence scores. Uh, on the live data. That's because it was new data it hadn't seen before. And so this final little image here, and I do apologize for being slightly smaller though, but this is actually what we got in the field. So this is actually a live video feed that we were ingesting and doing inference on. Um, so it was really cool to see how much you could actually crank and iterate on this particular project. Um, being able to use ground truth in that workflow drastically accelerate our timeline to get us a much more accurate model in a much smaller amount of time. All right. So a couple other things I wanted to show. Well, first, look at that. Our labeling job is in progress. That's good. Looks like we have 81 labels so far. So we'll see if we get a um, training job kicked off. It'll happen around 200, so fingers crossed. But I mentioned training jobs. So as human annotators go and we, the active learning job kicks off, the training jobs look just like any other Amazon SageMaker training job. So here in the console, we can actually see these are our ground truth demo training jobs. This is one that I previously ran. Um, we'll see a new one kick off if we get enough annotations during the session. But we can actually use these model artifacts to redeploy them. We can use them for transfer learning, for example. Um, and so these model artifacts, though, they are your standard model artifacts you get just from any SageMaker training job. Um, so for folks who are using Ground Truth as their baseline, they can actually use their active learning models for transfer learning to accelerate building their actual production models. And so we can actually see the models being hosted here. So here was our final model coming out of our demo itself. Living in S3 are our model artifacts. So it looks just like a regular SageMaker training job that's coming out of there. So it's definitely very cool. Um, I find it to be an immensely useful tool. We can actually see our annotations now coming out of our job we kicked off in the very beginning. Um, so you can see our labeling and all this. So this is all being created automatically by Ground Truth as this labeling job's running. So for those of you who are interested in running this labeling job yourself and actually playing around with Ground Truth, um, this notebook actually is living in the SageMaker examples. So if you launch a uh, SageMaker notebook through the SageMaker console, and you come in here, so this will be your home screen. You'll have a lot less noise <laughs> compared to me. I have a bunch of notebooks in here. Um, but if you click SageMaker examples, this will navigate you to all of our example notebooks. And we actually have an entire tab here dedicated to ground truth labeling jobs. And this will walk you through the process of creating your own labeling jobs, configuring your labeling jobs, measuring accuracy. Um, it'll walk you through some things to look for whenever you do them. And it'll also show you how you can immediately train models out of your labeling job. So um, a very useful resource for those of you who are looking to learn more and get started with Ground Truth. All right. We're getting close, guys. All right. 
<laughs> I want to show you guys kicking off this labeling job. Um, so this data set itself is actually a bunch of Google image pictures. So uh, we can see that they're, si they're similar but different. Um, so we'll see what it randomly pulls down. Fingers crossed that it's slightly more balanced. Um, whenever we actually go back into our viz, our visualization here, we can see how highly imbalanced our data set was that we trained on. Uh, so we had a lot more musical instruments than fruit with only a couple of cheetahs and tigers. Um, so hopefully this is more balanced because it's pulling randomly. But I think it is interesting how you can do these kind of analytics in your data sets themselves to find uh, things that are going to skew your model from the get-go. So imbalanced data sets are a classically hard problem to work with in machine learning. Um, for those of you who are working on use cases around things like fraud detection, for example, or any situation where you're trying to find what we call like the needle in the haystack, um, you're often going to have to work with highly imbalanced data sets. Um, so there are a couple of approaches to that. Uh, we could, for example, drop um, some samples of musical instruments, and that would help balance out our data sets a little bit more. Uh, we could take pictures of cheetahs and just copy them and inject them into the data set. That could help balance cheetahs more. Um, so there's a couple of different ways you can handle it. Uh, but there's ways you can actually normalize the data set themselves. Uh, so doing analysis up front like this on your data set is extremely important uh, for whenever you start training your machine learning model. Uh, because, you know, just because your model is 99.999% accurate, uh, if you only have five examples of, let's say, um, a positive and the rest of your examples are negative and it labels everything as negative but those three positives are what you were very interested in uh, you can have a high accuracy number with missing the most important part that you're looking for um, so understanding and balance up front and skewness in your data is very important okay Let's see where we are. All right, let's see if it did a training job. Hmm. All right, so not yet. Okay. Oh yeah, so. It I can't remember if I mentioned or not, but um, at the end of the session, I will be out back um, to discuss any questions that you guys have uh, and go deeper into the SageMaker platform as well if you're interested. Um, we do do a variety of workshops on this as well to include data labeling and getting kicked off with your machine learning models. Um, we also do um, work on actually understanding our algorithms, so how you can roll things like um, custom algorithms, deploying algorithms that we already have within the SageMaker tool itself, um, and also working with our SageMaker marketplace. So we actually offer a algorithm marketplace. So this is also a new feature we launched at reInvent. So for those of you who are getting started in machine learning um, and looking for a quick way to start experimenting with models that have already been trained, uh, within AWS Marketplace, I recommend going in and checking out um, some of the great algorithms our sponsors have already pre-trained. Um, so here we have, for example, anomaly detection algorithms. I was actually talking with a customer not too long ago um, who was trying to read in the barcodes on um, documents, and then they had an algorithm that then could understand the barcode and then sort it into a database. Uh, it turns out there's actually already a barcode algorithm for them. Um, so they were able to just deploy that and get rolling. Um, so a great resource for those of you who are brand new to machine learning and looking for um, how you can leverage the different technologies that our partners have already built in this domain. All right. Um, since we're waiting for people to label data, anyone has a Mechanical Turk account, by the way, feel free to log on and tag a couple images for me. Um, <laughs> but as that's, as that's working through, a couple other things to highlight on SageMaker and, and why it really can help accelerate your ability to build machine learning models. Um, so this endpoint hosting, I think, is really the coolest feature of Amazon SageMaker. We're actually running a demo right now that's using these endpoints, so it has a nice cool front end um, that users can access 
and they can actually make queries to this endpoint, but it's really transparent to the user, right? So the user, they have data, and they ask a question, and a model result comes back. It's magic. Uh, on the back end, the infrastructure that supports that is actually the Amazon SageMaker endpoint. And so here's one of those in service, and we can actually see um, the metrics coming in, and we can do auto scaling around it, and all this great stuff. Um, for your training jobs as well, you'll see the same information. So you can actually right scale your training instances and all of that good stuff too. Um, so we can see this instance is actually very much oversized. We can see our CP utilization, disk utilization, things like that. So these are really the features that are in SageMaker that make it really nice um, to iterate on your machine learning models to make sure you're not uh, wasting compute power and you're able to optimize uh, your machine learning model deployment. Historically, this has been the hardest part I know for me as a data scientist um, to be able to do, which is actually packaging my model and deploying it into something my application can use. Um, so this is actually a really cool feature built into SageMaker. So once we have our you know, data set finally labeled and we want to take maybe one of these models that GroundTruth built and deploy that, we can do that behind one of these endpoints. And so it's very easy. In fact, we can just go in and do a click and then you can just create endpoints from that within the console itself. Um, so you could theoretically uh, deploy something that was actively trained in ground truth directly into an endpoint, should you so want to. I would recommend doing the analysis in that notebook like I showed first to make sure you trust the performance of the model. Um, but that capability is completely integrated into this tool. All right. Darn. Okay. Um This is where I wish I could take questions. <laughs> um, okay. So we can actually look through though and see the different images that are getting labeled as they're being labeled. Um, unsurprisingly, I believe this is gonna be highly skewed towards musical instruments again, given that our first 10 pages of labels are all musical instruments. But as people crank through this and label it, the job will kick off. Um, as, as they do their iterations of labeling. Um, and we'll actually be able to start seeing active learning happening. Unfortunately, I don't think it's gonna happen within the next 10 minutes. Um, okay. All right, guys, well, I think Come see me in about 15 minutes, <laughs> and I can show you the active learning actually happening and the labeling happening. I'm sorry you weren't able to knock it out um, within the allotted time. But uh, that's actually all that I had for Ground Truth. Um, so with that, thank you for coming to the session today. Um, please make sure you do your survey and leave feedback for me. Uh, I'll be outside to answer any questions you have about labeling, your machine learning problems, SageMaker. Um, please come talk to me. and. Thank you, everybody.